So uh, welcome everyone. A quick note that we are recording and that the recording will be published on our YouTube channel History at Newcastle. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land wherever uh, we may all be located and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and in particular to the Pamelong clan of the Awabagal people of the land in which the Callaghan campus resides and where we in the room are located today. Our speaker today, co-hosted by the Gender Research Network at UON, is Dr. Paula Jane Byrne. She is author of Criminal Law and Colonial Subject, published by Cambridge, and The Diaries and Letters of Ellis Bent, published by Desert P. Uh, at present, and for a project on women and intellectual life in New South Wales, in between 1830 and 1880, she is a visiting scholar at the State Library of New South Wales. And her paper today stems from that project and is titled Women and Intellectual Life in New South Wales to Rose Selwyn. Over to you. Thank you. I acknowledge the sovereignty of the Awabakal people. I would also like to acknowledge Gambania, Yeagle and Bunchalan people at Grafton, where much of this paper is set. This work is part of a project on women and intellectual life in New South Wales from 1830. It's based on the Scott, Rusden and Selwyn papers held at the State Library of New South Wales, where I'm visiting scholar. Thank you for having me here today. This paper is about a mind, the threads of thinking I have found in the papers of Rose Selwyn. While there has been a significant amount of biographical work done on late 19th century Australian women, there has not been a great deal of close analysis of women's thinking and intellectual influences. Lucy Gray did not give, for example, her biographer Meg Vivers much in the way of what parts of evangelical thought she identified with or embraced at a time of great energy in that section of the Anglican religion. I have also been interested for some time now in what actually colonised New South Wales and where violence to and oppression of Indigenous people fitted in the, psych the psyche of colonising people. I worked on squatter humour and family history to locate different colonial psyches. Rose Selwyn assists in such research. Rose Selwyn was the youngest daughter of Anne and Reverend George Keylock Rusden of St. Peter's Church, East Maitland. The family had come to New South Wales in 1834. Rose married Arthur Selwyn in 1853. Arthur was initially a squatter, but due to lack of funds had to become an Anglican minister and was given the parish of Grafton in 1852. He eventually became Dean of Newcastle, where he and Rose lived after 1869. The Selwyns and their extended families would never have called themselves middle class. Rather, they would use terms such as the upper 10,000, as they were related to gentry, to military officers in India, and to plantation owners in the West Indies, all of whom were global, mobile people and secure in their connections. So this paper can't be a chapter in the history of the middle classes. Rose Selwyn was an early feminist and gave several public lectures. The last document I have entitled The Aborigines was written in late 1903 or early 1904. Rose died in 1905. One of my papers in this series was on dress and the making of dress by the Rosden women. Dress making and the putting together of dress is the making of self. When I say that, it relates to the work of Maureen Daly Goggins, particularly her, in her work in the book, Women and Things. Historians working around this project are used to or aware of looking at disparate scraps of material, notes, pins, threads, and seeing these articles as a form of rhetoric, a statement, a communication. The records of Rose Selwyn held at the State Library of New South Wales come in a blue box. Opening it, one does not find a series of letters written throughout her life, giving a clear picture of her influences and her reading of books, for example. Rather, there are scraps from the whole of her life, stories, 
poems by herself and others, a journal of copied poems and pencil sketches, speeches, mostly undated, and odd letters to Rose. There are about 400 different items in this box. Rose also wrote a memoir she seems to have written for publication, but it is the contents of the box I'll mainly discuss today. Faced with scraps, I wanted to see threads of Rose's thinking. It's a form of communication, and today I want to talk about some of the links or threads I have found. These are the threads I see. Rose may not have been aware she was giving them in her gathering of scraps for the archive. For the historian, it is a kind of balancing act, difficult sources like depositions and courage. Paige Dubois would say, I'm creating a dream of holes out of these scraps. Mm. And this is what Marianne Deva, Sally Newman, and Anne Mercury call elliptical research. I have become more interested in what a subject does not know they're giving, rather than the narrative they create in structuring the archive. The links I make between the different texts I've presented with are not necessarily the links that Rose Selwyn would make. The first aspect of the collection I want to discuss is poetry. And Rose's interest throughout her life lies in poetry concerning the actual moment of death. Some of this poetry is soothing and some of it involves anxiety. Where has the person gone? If you were to meet them in the afterlife, would they remember you? What is the relationship of the soul to the body? For those left, there is a horrible void and emptiness. In 1869, in 1869, um, <clears throat> Rose copied Robert Browning's Epitaph in the Catacombs into her scrapbook. This is only part of a much longer poem, Christmas Eve and Easter Day, and so Rose has selected this particular stanza. A slave who burned to death by Caesar after fighting beasts, at the close, a hand came through the fire above my head and drew my soul to Christ, whom I now see. Browning's tone is almost flippant. We know of the slave's death because a brother, Sergius, writes this testimony on the wall. For me, I have forgot it all. The speaking voice slips for the reader who must contemplate memory and no memory in death. The dead man does not speak directly to us. He slipped behind a veil at the poem's end. He's gone, and his own memories of being alive are gone. The poem is an unsettling play with narration. Rose copied Coventry Patmore's five from Mrs. Graham, Graham also from Mrs. Graham, also part of a longer poem, The Victories of Love. It's jumped. In death, there is uncertainty of the fate of the soul, but this the God of love lets be, horrible uncertainty. Patmore's stanza portrays the physicality of the subject, the woman's body, her actions in life. It was here she sat and worked, and there she combed and kissed the children's hair. The sense of physicality is utterly present in the poem, but at the end of the poem, she is gone and everywhere her grave. Rose copied Bishop Hines' poem concerning the death of a baby. It deals specifically with the moment of death. Again, it weeps, and God does take it from the mother's arms, from present pain and future unknown harm, and baby sleeps. This is a consoling poem. However, a poem copied into the scrapbook, New Year 1860, specifically refers to the confinement in the grave, the joyous New Year bells. Speak not for you, silent dead, neath the moss grown low, decaying, each in their lonely, narrow bed, sealed in, silence, hopeful, holy. Their souls over paradise may range. The body waits for the soul, for the day of judgment. There are voices from the grave, lonely souls trodden down by Satan's will. There is no reprieve for these lonely, wailing souls. The poem speaks from this narrow sealed space requesting God for me a Christian tomb. This is an anxious evangelical influence poem dealing with the darkness of the Prince of Air. 
its claustrophobic atmosphere centers on the body after death, still present, waiting. In its physicality, it bears comparison to the art of Daniel Gabriel Rossetti, particularly his painting Sir Lancelot in the Queen's Chamber, 1857, where Lancelot is hardly able to stand in the cramped space of the picture. This attention to the body at death or confined is the first aspect of the aesthetic we find in Rose's collection. In 1880, Rose copied William Wilberforce's poem about the death of his wife, written in 1841, A Vision, where there is another emphasis on physicality. Christ, veiled and unrecognized, comes to the door of the house to ask for the dying woman. There rose this wife and mother and went into the night. She followed at his bidding and was hidden from our sight. Christ is revealed in the last line, for I saw his hands were pierced. This poem was found among the papers of William Wilberforce after his death, and Rose copied it from volume one of his life published in the 1860s. Evangelicals like Wilberforce engage with pain, and this poem deals with the pain of the author and the physical pain of the piercing of Christ's hands, as well as the unrecognized Christ in bodily form. An important aspect to all of these poems is physicality, the body. We see the slave being burned, the child dying, the body in the coffin, and we do not know what happens to us after death. The second thread I found concerns religious belief. In May 1863, Amelia Gilman sent her sister Rose a memorial of a visit to the graveyard on the island of Wight. Three ivy leaves were carefully sewn on the page that also described an inscription on the grave of Reverend William Adams, author of the enormously popular The Shadow of the Cross. Amelia copied William Henry Davenport Adams' description of the grave. The old churchyard was surrounded by trees within hearing of the murderous waves. The tomb was coffin shaped with a cross of iron placed over it horizontally so as to cast a continuous shadow, an allusion to his book. The ivy had been gathered in the graveyard. The page represents a complicated set of influences. Ivy symbolized immortality and three sown in triangular form represent the trinity. Ivy, however, because of its link with to the god Dionysus, also related to sexual desire and fidelity in that desire. It carries both connotations, so that devotion is tinged with sexuality. It's possible to grasp in that combination of emotions some of the sensibility of the late 19th century. Adams wrote his works while he was dying of consumption, and his last book was a representation of insanity. He was, according to the Dictionary of National enormously popular. Amelia's page, like many of the texts referred to in Rose Selwyn's papers, lay with the edges of the world, with death, opium and insanity. Arthur Selwyn wrote to Rose in 1851, as far as you say, you're perhaps a little much inclined to, what shall I say, mysteriousness, or to be led by your imagination in matters of religious duty. Rose Selwyn's scrapbook kept throughout her life and references to books and letters indicate that her interest in mysteriousness did not decline following her marriage to Arthur Selwyn, who was, he said, rather the reverse. Rose was certainly not alone in beliefs. The idea of the Trinity shown in Amelia's memoir was a cornerstone of the Tractarian variant of the Anglican faith. Its beliefs favoured ritual, ornament and communion and adherents saw themselves as deriving from the ancient Anglican Church of St. Alban and St. Bede rather than the decisions of Henry VIII. This trace of the image of three aligns Amelia and Rose with at least the symbolics of that branch of Anglicanism. Belief, however, need not be subject to any notion of uniformity or discipline, nor need it be logical. That's Peter Gesheer. And this is supported by Boyd Hilton's description of Anglicans selecting, perhaps unconsciously, from different traditions. It's not possible to say Rose was Tractarian, but there are further indications of this influence. She kept the design of an altar cloth, sent from Samarez near Armadale in 1876. The elaborate ornamentation of the church was part of Tractarian beliefs. This one is remarkably ornate 
and the colors listed are crimson, rose, blue, and gold. The iconography seems almost tropical. To me, used to white old cloths, it seems loud. That's a passion flower. Further evidence concerning a Tractarian influence can be found in a small cardboard note about reason found among her papers. There is not sufficient evidence that there is not a God. It is therefore immoral to believe it. But men must act every day. Actions spring from beliefs upon sufficient evidence. We must not act on those beliefs which we have on insufficient evidence. This being so, a wise man will act on such beliefs as taken for granted. There should be a with that, but she has left it up, with lasting useful results. Moreover, it is difficult to prove an affirmative and it is impossible to prove a negative. Now, to act on a belief there is no God has, if true, no such results. There is in that case nothing, no God, no hereafter, no judgment, no rewards. Reason thus speaks impartially, and following reason and acting on its dictates, we find in a short time that such actions open up sources of evidence hitherto closed and always closed to me, who will not act upon reason's dictates. If any man wishes to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. John 7, 17, Clifford, Ethics of Belief. And always close to me is a rejection of reason, a kind of stepping out of the argument. William Kingdon, Kingdon Clifford's address to the Metaphysical Society um, entitled Ethics of Belief was published in 1876 and argued that belief must be guided by evidence and it was wrong to believe with insufficient evidence. Clifford was a philosopher and mathematician and Rose appears interested in mathematics. Her short story, Corporella, begins with discussions of equilateral and isosceles triangles, and she includes some of her father's maths puzzles in her scrapbook. The passage in Rose's papers does not follow the arguments responding to Clifford by contemporary thinkers, nor does it reflect Arthur's views, as he wrote in 1851, reason kindles human faith. And this was very much the view of Anne Rusden, Rose's mother. The cardboard note reflects a struggle with the idea of reason that Rose's mother had overcome in her reading of natural theology in the 1850s. Anne Rusden easily found that God was unfathomable, that the earth, his work, was open to all kinds of investigation. Here in Rose's scrap of cardboard, the author refuses reason's dictates and will discover the doctrine of God by doing his will without concern for reason. Newman, the Anglican theologian who joined the Catholic Church, only made such a refusal. refusal sorry. All the emotion and desire are on the side of faith and all the coldness and death on the side of reason. From Rosa's interests, apparent in her scraps, it was such emotion that informed her way of seeing the world. There is another emphasis she, there's another aspect to her emphasis on physicality in all the poems she copied. It has import due to the mid-century controversy over the incarnation of Christ and the notion of atonement. Jan Melissa Schramm has shown how this controversy over the sacrifice of Christ for humanity provided an underlying tension reflected in English law, politics and novels. The painful death of Christ was the atonement for the sins of men. All of these tensions emerge from engagement with the real bloody and pierced body of Christ, his pain. Catholic theology threatened to conflate the created order with the sacred in its emphasis on the physical body of Christ. In the Eucharist, the wafer of communion bread eaten in both Anglican and Catholic services. This pull in the culture towards the body and embodiment resulted in tensions that had powerful ramifications for all cultural life. The suffering body was the pervasive image of the period. 
Rose's choice of poems in her scrapbook and her, in her own writing emerged, engaged closely with physicality. Um, Mrs. The woman's work about the house in Mrs. Graham, the confinement of the coffin and the embodiment of Christ as a visitor to Wilberforce. Rose's short story called Varela, written in 1888, also engages with physicality. Its main subject was women's work, but it was also concerned with the care of the body. The Duke and Duchessa wear their servant down and the health of the family is threatened. Mm -hmm. The doctor saves them. As the servant Corporella revives, so magically do her employers. The doctor recalls his English mother saying, Christians who believe in the incarnation, the resurrection and the ascent of our Lord, will strive to honour and reverence both in themselves and in others that body which he thus consecrated and glorified, and glorify in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Religious interests extended outside the family. There are reference to Rosa's circle, Mrs Hoskins, Mrs Hogg and Mrs Isaacs, Mrs Ogilvy, in a letter from Arthur Selwyn in 1851. This circle includes Eliza Armstrong, whose diary survives. Eliza Armstrong was deeply spiritual. She heard voices telling her where to find things she had lost. She thought her wayward children were saved from terrible accidents by unseen hands, and she had great faith in the powers of Mary, Mother of God. Eliza Armstrong followed that version of Anglicanism that emerged after the Pia Nono of 1854, whereby the Pope declared the Immaculate Conception of Mary she was not born of Adam, but had another nature. Well, evangelicals bitterly opposed such a pronouncement. Tractarians engaged with the aesthetics of Mary, and Coventry Patmore wrote poetry concerning her presence. Milk sweet mother. This theology was based on women-centered thinking, and discussion and such women-centeredness can also be found in Rose's watercolors. Rose created a series of watercolours of Grafton for her family. These were meant to be almost photographic portraits of the house and streets of the town. When the Selwyns lost a tall tree from their garden, Anne Marsden remarked in 1851 that she could imagine how it was missed because she had seen it in one of the paintings sent. Like the scrapbook, the paintings come from different years of Rose's life and they're worked upon sketches sometimes two or three of the same subject, with penciled criticisms on their bridal too long redraw appears in the picture of the post office from 1861. It was Maria Crystal, relative of the artist Joshua Crystal, who in a letter to Grace Rusden read the artworks in a way that was not photographic. She wrote to Grace Rusden in 5th of November 1856 that Rose was kindling and spreading the light and knowledge in the pathless wilderness that have only been known to their divine maker through past centuries. The little cottage of which I have a sketch, how does it convey cultivation of souls and minds and all good things into the far off shores so recently unknown and unheard of? Writing her version of Terra Nullius or Empty Land, Maria Crystal in fact points out to an absence in the sketches that move us into unreality. Grafton would have been crowded with Gambania, Yegel, and Bunjalung people who have their own histories at their websites. No Aboriginal person appears in Rose's illustrations. Figures drawn in the watercolours were placed there by Rose for specific reasons. And they appear to be drawn in after the sketch was completed and sometimes when the watercolour was completed. Men appear rarely there are, in most paintings, women. A lone single woman makes her way to church. A woman in the street. Sorry. Uh, a, there are women in the street. Two women stand and greet at Newborn Grove. <clears throat> stands in front of Gordon Brook. The landscapes are feminized. The women in Rose's watercolours are dressed in bonnets and gowns suitable for their public appearance. They clasp their hands neatly walking to church or standing in front of their houses. Their clothing is white and blue, the colours of innocence, and the working blue of the colony. In later drawings, they are mauve, and mauve seems to dominate. This shows Rose's interest in fashion, 
as the new mauve was invented in 1857 and became enormously popular in the colony in 1859, where 37 references to it appear in the colonial press. Women are intensely present in the watercolours and we catch them on their busy perambulations. One could think that these watercolours reflect a particular colonising worldview, most apparent in Maria Crystal's evaluation of them. Yet we can't avoid the centrality of women to this landscape. Women who were alone or in, together in twos. Women were both fulfilling a role expected of them and also a strong presence on their own. The next thread I've found involves publishing. Amelia Gilman, Rose's sister, printed her poems. These were printed by John Daniel Printers at South Petherton in Somersetshire on single sheets. One would pay per thousand copies, though I'm not certain if num the number could be reduced. Such poems were distributed to family and friends and sent to Australia. In Rose's collection is also a short story, The White Stone, published by Sarana Scott, her sister, though it is not clear and uh, where and how. These were texts of a religious nature and such printing derives from the practice in the 18th century of printing sermons and religious texts. We know from the work of Marion Ann Taylor that such publishing was extensively undertaken by women. She gives the example of Mary Martha Sherwood, Charlotte Mary Tucker and Julia Corner, who published hundreds of religious stories and texts. Looking recently at books for children in the late 19th century, female authors predominate. That a woman could publish her poems, could enter the pretextual public sphere easily, means that when a poem was written, there were very, very real audiences in mind. These poems were not just for the self, but for others. I do not think that the emotional texture of this relationship can be reduced to the idea of performance, which jars with belief. These printed poems of Amelia's with their religious subject matter are more in the strain of sermons and thus involve religious intimacy with the reader. What we have access to in uh, Rose's papers is what Martin Lyons terms a reading community, as well as her own thinking and selecting. Martin Lyons moved away from the notion of the individual reader, reading as a solitary act, to the idea of communities of readers. A reader may be a member of several such communities, gendered, work-related or religious. Reading and sharing texts is evidence also of what Julian Silverman calls a communion of reading, whereby 19th century subjects read as an act of intimacy, both with the author and with other readers. The strands of thought are found so far among a communion of readers as well as Rose. Women's centeredness and physicality apparent in the poems would come together in her speeches. Eliza Armstrong and Rose Selwyn were both active in the Girls' Friendly Society. This organisation was begun in Sydney in January 1879, having been established in London in 1875. The GFS was concerned at the fate of the young, unaccompanied single women arriving in the cities without guidance or assistance. It operated on two levels. Firstly, through the organisations of young women who met to talk and fundraise, and secondly, through operation of lodges for single women. 600 young women passed through the rented lodges in William Street, North Sydney, between 1887 and 1920. The aim of the society was to band together as a society ladies as associate leaders and girls as members for mutual help, for sympathy and prayer to encourage purity of life, dutifulness to parents, faithfulness to employers and thrift. By 1883, there were 11 branches in Sydney and Rose Selwyn was involved in setting up the Newcastle branch. We can't tell how prevalent tractarian thought was in the society, but what this society did, like the purity organisations discussed by Helen Jones in her study of South Australia, was to give the women involved access to a certain public sphere. Rose was a vice president of the GFS and in some of her speeches were published and reported in the press. The GFS is only one of many organisations that gave women a chance of, to speak and to lead. Jill Rowe has written of the Theosophical Societies throughout rural Australia. 
where women played a major role. In the early 1890s, Rose corresponded with Emily Jones, an English socialist and editor of a magazine for women workers, a threefold horde, who favoured women of different classes joined together in the Mothers' Union, Women's League or Union of Workers. Those who pray and work together can hardly think badly of each other. Emily Jones wrote in an undated letter, where there is sympathy, mothers will stand a great deal of plain talk, even from an unmarried woman like myself. If you don't preach at them, it is very easy to reach them. Emily wanted to make meetings and largely devotional and then tack out questions related to the building up of a pure social and family life. In an undated letter, she related what such groups of women would do. Their aims would be vigilance work, the keeping up of police to their duty, the reform of the laws, the promotion of the return of the best citizens to positions of importance in municipal and colonial government work, high-minded men. Women were certainly engaged in the public world, but they were to be engaged in a separate capacity to men. Women's only groups thus form the beginning for the conceptualization of the public woman. Emily Jones' emphatic underlying her sense of imperative and urgency evolved from contemplating the fallen woman and the pressing need to save her. Rose developed a similar emphatic tone, except she identified. She identified with the working woman and in her own publications and speeches moved further than Emily Jones in advocating for women's political involvement and their representation. In November 1892, Rose wrote to her niece, Rose Scott, about her support for the push to have the age of consent raised. She related two stories, one about a child of 13 or 14 attending a public school who was disgraced by a pupil teacher, another about a registrar. Of the school teacher, Rose wrote, if the law is amended, we women may lift our heads up high. Rather than seeing the girls as objects of pity, a common position for 19th century philanthropic women in Australia, and an important component of early feminism, even Rose Sports, Rose becomes one with them as we, as women. Thus the body, the suffering female body, is key to her thinking, and it is a body she is part of. Rose used rhetorical techniques in all of her public addresses. She proceeded by listing her points and providing examples to illustrate her argument. Listing linked to reason and mathematics, examples were designed to raise the sympathy of, or empathy of the listener. They dealt with feeling. In Should Women Be Jurors, Rose used the example of an 1886 woman tried for murder, Mrs. Bartlett who was nearly condemned because men's experience did not help them to adjudicate on the case. Mrs. Bartlett was worn down with nursing and women know what it is to be worn with nursing. Mothers can hardly keep awake. The jurors thought she could have got up to see to her husband who had overdosed on chloroform. Women would know she simply couldn't. In On the Peculiar Fitness of Women to Help in the Government of the Nation, Rose concludes with her reference to purity. The friendless young man who in Newcastle or Sydney amid temptation dares to lead a really pure life is a Christian hero. The humble maid of all work who serves a hard master or mistress faithfully for Christ's sake is a Christian heroine. In this last section, Rose might be seen to be conforming to the ideals of the Purity Leagues but it is also a levelling of the strata of society and has its origin in socialism. In On the Peculiar Fitness of Women to Help in the Government of the Nation, the examples Rose used were from the Bible and from history. Rose moves on to the qualities of women. Are they, she asks, the same as men? No. Women possess the passive virtues, faith, hope, love, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, patience, and temperance. All of these virtues were present in Queen Victoria, and they had been singularly adapted to contribute to the happiness and prosperity of the people over which she ruled. Rose added, the same result could not have been obtained by any man. In this section of her speech, women are indeed pitted against men. The Queen has been responsible for great achievements. No man was involved. These results were specific to women, 
and their different and separate nature. For Rose, the public woman who seeks to govern is something apart from men. Her virtues are listed and added to. And this must be the intellectualism and bravery shown by women in history. So we have strands of thinking present in her poetry and art appearing in her public speeches. This woman-centeredness because women were different to men and this emphasis on the suffering body and the equality of all. Where these perspectives abruptly stop is in her paper on the Aborigines. And this paper, I think, gives us some of the greatest insight into the mentality of the squatter that we have. In the years Rose was in Grafton, punitive raids were carried on by magistrates on camps of their own servants. These magistrates formed a central part of Selwyn's social circle. Rose lived among violent people and was part of a colonising culture. She also had numbers of Aboriginal servants, beginning with a black boy, as Anne wrote on the 6th of June, 1855. Geoffrey is further discussed in Rose's memoir, and if read carefully, we can get a sense of Geoffrey's theology, though I think that belongs to his family. Geoffrey was beaten by Arthur Selwyn, and this is what distinguishes Aboriginal servants from non-Aboriginal servants, physical violence. Rose's paper on the Aborigines in no way refers to frontier violence, but proceeds by examples of her remembered experience with Gambania, Yegel, and Banjalan people. In it, the idea of suffering body was not applied to Aboriginal people. Rather, Rose created a narrative of happiness in order to argue in favour of Aboriginal people. Rose uses examples from the Aboriginal camp very near the township of Grafton to make three point, listed points about Aboriginal people. These are that they are sympathetic, they are full of innocent merriment, they are kind to each other. Rose is endowing Aboriginal people with humanity in disagreement with persons who would argue that Aboriginal people were not kind without humour or sympathy. The example she gives are stories from her own life that are designed to amuse the audience. Rose is hidden, a hidden witness to a game by two unnamed young girls where the relationship between mistress and servant was parodied. Mrs. White was seated on a log of wood, her face steadily fixed in a scowl of anger. Miss Black approached her humbly with a few little sticks in her hand. Please, Mrs. Hear Waddy, firewood. Mrs. White scowled in reply, crossly ordering more waddy, to which Miss Black humbly agreed, but they had to stop and relieve their feelings by merry laughter. The girls swapped roles. This went on for some time. Had a food was promised in return for more sticks, but the promise was broken, which amused them excessively. This account of a parody rose indicates is proof of her point. They are full of innocent merriment. But this story also has another message of cruelty Rose acknowledges with shame and also the absence and withholding of food, which was not directly addressed by her. Her stories of King Sandy, the Dean's own man, he called him master, involve Sandy being given a suit of clothes in which he looked well and happy, but he appeared the next day without them. When he asked, he said, I gave them to Jimmy, you give me more. Jimmy was not allowed to keep the clothes, for Sandy had many friends who would all expect the same. This story, too, has a subtext concerning the nature of the gift, which was under the giver's control. It was not truly given and was taken back by Arthur Selwyn, so the gift was false. White inconstancy, falsity and cruelty have long been stressed by Aboriginal people in Australia as endemic in the policies developed for them. Rose's narrative derives directly from squatter humour in their own tales of cruelty, particularly apparent in the columns of the, from the Namoi River in the Maitland Mercury in the 1840s and 1850s. When she said that King Sandy reminded her only once of his royal status, I say, Mrs. Look here, all this belong to me, she is invoking the extensive humour about kings among squatters, as well as reporting a statement about possession. In a sense, she is simply relating a squatter discourse that recognised Aboriginal politics and sometimes sought to utilise it. Yet a woman who was quick to identify the suffering body in all women 
did not extend such a view to Aboriginal people. Rather, she was caught in the discourse of the innocent, noble savage, deriving from Rousseau, where Indigenous people were quiet, innocent, at one with nature, and childlike. According to Stephen Muiki, this is the major positive discourse available to Australians. But in another sense, Rose is a vehicle for Aboriginal readings of the colonists. What was valued in uh, Rose's talk was the um, work of Ernest Gribble in the north of Australia, who had found a fine race of 200 people on the Mitchell River. He had wonderful success, and the whole atmosphere of the place is religious. Rose also mentioned that Aboriginal people had their own parliament and court, and that they hold, that they hold together. Though this was not explained further, the idea of parliament relating to Aboriginal people was suggestive. And Rose here was suggesting other models of Aboriginal organisation, albeit under the eyes of Gribble. Again, we detect another message in her talk, the association of the word parliament with Aboriginal people. Rose may be showing some of the complexity of the squatter character. She also undermined the power they had. It um, also connects to a suggestion of the power of the squatter discourse, that one has to hide one's messages in this way when she's so forthright in other speeches based on suffering. Or perhaps she can't countenance the Aboriginal suffering her family members were responsible for. In her 1892 letter to her niece Rose concerning the male wretches who abused girls and women, the anger Rose shows in her underlining was apparent also in the frustration she felt with Rose Scott only being able to use her salon to influence politicians. Rose Selwyn felt that women were struck doubly dumb, first in having no voice when abused, and secondly, unable to speak their own views in politics. This is not something her mother would have written, but her mother had a totally different relation to male power. She found it humorous. Rose was engaging with the idea that women were silenced, and this silencing of women was a common aspect of feminist rhetoric of the period. One feels her frustration, her claustrophobia that was so much part of her interest in the body. All of this thinking related to physicality and the suffering dealt also with confinement. Rejection of reason, contemplation of feelings and women-centeredness led Rose to a consideration of a new kind of female-shaped public. This public would not include Aboriginal people, but she suggests also in her use of the word parliament that Aboriginal people had a public of their own. It was absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, can I open up for uh, questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula, for a really thought-provoking paper. And I'd like to raise a couple of questions, both from the fact that we're sitting in the Hunter, <laughs> and I'm interested in the fact that Rose Selwyn had a, a wide correspondence with women um, who were probably the intellectual leaders in New South Wales. And I'd like to, I mean, did Rose feel part of all of that? Did she feel part of an ongoing conversation mm -hmm. uh, about, there's obviously uh, an important conversation as an Anglican uh, yeah. about the existence of God and the relationship of women to that and that concept of suffering. And the fact that you ended up talking about her lecture on Aboriginal people and uh, that she had some quite generous views, but in the end, that wouldn't be really part of the wider colonial society. So I just wondered if you'd like to make some comments about that. Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> I think um, the 
when you look at the, all of the, her contemporaries, yes. they are all coming to feminism from different roots, I completely see. different roots. So that's very and that's what's so interesting about it is that you'll find, you know, um, uh, people become, some of them become preachers in the Unitarian Church. Okay. Some of them um, become spiritualists, mm -hmm. you know, some of them um, become um, involved in, in uh, different uh, forms of um, purity organizations. So they're coming from all different, and, and when I think um, patterns of feminism, um, I think I, I think people have looked at that and, and said there, there are quite a number of differences that um, once they, people get into organizations, you know, Rose Scott, for instance, once she got into organizations, there were enormous arguments mm. that happened as a result of the differences in yes. the way they came. Yes. So it's very hard to fathom. I was interested in Emily Jones and her uh, correspondence with an English socialist woman and um, her um, picking, whether she picked up from Emily Jones the idea of um, women, all women uh, being we or equal, that was present elsewhere also in another form. But it seems stronger in Rose Selwyn than in Rose Scott, mm. that all women are equal, that the working woman is equal to me. Yes. And I, I think um, there's, there's a bit of a history of her relationship with servants that's, mm. that feeds into that. Yes. You know? um, the next one you asked about, um, yes, they were going to create altogether <clears throat> a totally different world. It's not a matter of joining the public space that was already in existence. Mm. No, nobody wanted that. Uh, they wanted a new kind of public, a new kind of female influenced public mm -hmm. totally different to to the public or the idea of the public that already existed so um if you remember um henny russell she's written about uh, how the i had it in the paper i'm going to mention how um the house See, all of these women develop their ideas by visiting each other's houses in yes. the afternoons. Yes. And if you read Mabel Ogilvie's diaries, mm. she's, she's going around visiting everybody in the afternoons. And they're having these discussions by themselves. Women are having these discussions by themselves. Well, um, Penny Russell has the argument that the house, the home, is also the public. Mm. In, in mm. that sense, you know, that idea mm. that the, the public world comes into the home with dining and, yes. and also with um, the number of visitors and the numbers of visitors is astronomical. Yes, yes. I mean, you're never at home alone. No, no, there are always people coming and there are always people staying, sometimes for months, mm. sometimes years, <laughs> they're staying with you. you know? yeah. So you're never alone in the home wanting to get out, kind of thing. It's and so that's a, that's a very interesting argument. But this, these women together are, are making a new kind of public. Well, it's going to look totally different. On the other hand, it's an exclusive public, if I may say so. Um, in her case, with her interest mm. in, in the working woman, I would say um, not. Okay. Know? I think that's where she differs from a lot of other people mm. because there's a lot of maternalism. And to use Aileen Morton Robinson, mm. you know, th there's a lot of maternalism present in that first wave feminism, but she doesn't seem to have it as strongly. Not as you have the idea of purity that strongly. The second point you were making uh, that Aboriginal people were not uh, to be recognised in this new public. Um, in a sense, she's indicating that they have a public, they have a, a, a parliament of their own, that they have their own ways of doing things. So um, if the world had been different, yes. who knows yes. How, yes. how these ideas would have altered. Yes. But it is very limiting as, you know, the limitations out. I'll yes. just pick up on uh, another, another point, and that was in relation to the hunter, that these families seem to have, um, you know, you mentioned the East Maitland Girls Friendly Society, but they're also going up coast, the New South Wales coast to, to Grafton and I'm very interested that, you know, these conversations are taking place 
out, you know, in, in the region, so to speak. Oh, yes, yeah. And I find that very interesting. Yeah, well, you, you've got... Um, You've got Katie Hume, um, yes. Drayton Toowoomba, yes. and, and she's um, having all of these discussions in the yes. workplace. As I mean. And if you remember with Gio Rowe's book, yes. the most interesting thing was Bundaberg yes. with the theos in the theosophy. So, and women involved in theosophy in Bundaberg. So it, it is going, no, and no squatter is sedentary. No. Um, I've just written an article called um, Australian Squatter Space that's in Britain and the World. And the thing is that nobody ever stays in one place for very long. The men, the men mm. are really home. That's the key thing. Yes. The men are really home. They're travelling. They've got runs all everywhere, all up the Namo, and they've got runs in Queensland. They've got runs right up the rights, right, you know, right up near the north of Queensland. And and they're never home. Men are never home. Women seem to have money and trust. Quite a few. Women, like Rose Selwyn, she had a thousand pounds in trust, her own money. When she was married to Arthur, he didn't control her money. So there's a lot, you know, of the interesting things about money as yes. well, and this yes. independence, you know, that they that they possess that we haven't. Uh, I, yes, we you know, it's probably a lot written about that. But um, also um, um, the the interesting thing about them is that the women are frequently travelling to Sydney. And, uh, for instance, the Ogilvies, they've got a house at Evoca, and they're staying at Evoca, so you find a lot of the squatters, the, the women, I'm trying to work out if it's seasonal. If it's seasonal, then come into Sydney, or if they yes. just regularly come to Sydney. So this mobility, you know, a lot of people have said to me, oh, I isolated in the house out in the bush, but it's not the case. Not with the better these women, yes. Not necessarily with the, not necessarily with the workers, um, because they're travelling as well from contract to contract, mm -hmm. and they have got their Methodism, and they're you know different with Catholicism, and also you've got the Anglican preachers who are trying to reach them, who are saying, who are never at home as well, who are saying, um, you've got to appeal to a public like in a in a democratic kind of way. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to mention the... Uh, no, there was, yeah, this... Oh. Yeah. Okay, can I ask? Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, thank you so much. It's a very compelling and fascinating presentation. I learned a lot and I'm totally coming from a different field in terms of uh, time and context. I'm a historian of late Ottoman Empire. Um, so uh, I have a um, couple of questions. Um, so if, uh, as far as... I understand from your presentation, if I understand correctly, for sure, we are encountering a kind of modern intellectual, uh, very sophisticated intellectual, and a little bit enigmatic to a certain extent in my eyes, uh, who kind of uh, did not put a clear cut demar demarcation between the secular life, mundane life, and the otherworldly or heavenly. So her understanding of uh, the relationship between belief and the evidence. So she doesn't have that kind of Descartes Cartesian kind of world, if I understand correctly. So uh, I was wondering, uh, what did she represent or stand for in the late 19th century Australian history as an intellectual? Did she engage in any European intellectuals, European thoughts, or, you know, uh, or what makes her unique or original, you know? In, uh, from the perspective of the late 19th century Australian uh, history. Also, did she uh, write or mention or touch upon the issue of sexuality or gender? Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. It's very interesting when, you know, because I did talk about purity. And the thing is that there's, um, there's purity and there's purity in, in the sense that she <laughs> doesn't have a very strong idea of purity in that address to the Girls' Friendly Society. It's mainly about, um, nothing about purity, but that the girls, in fact, are not friendly enough to each other, and also that they're critical of each other's dress. And the thing is that she's, um, so she doesn't have that strong stand of, of the influence of purity in, in her, her work. In terms of her, um, it's very interesting, you know, because I've been there. Uh, when you read Gillian Silverman, she has this um, 
this notion that people in their reading are engaging with each other, this is intellectual life, in, a, in an intimate way, that reading becomes an act of intimacy with others, both others who have read the book and others who um, you will discuss the book with. It's such an interesting idea because what that does is break down the edges of the liberal subject. Mm -hmm. So the liberal subject, rather than being somebody with clearly defined individual sort of boundaries, becomes someone who's involved in something that, that they're of reading, for instance, involved in something much broader than the self. And this ties in with um, Catholicism mm -hmm. and the, the way Catholicism dominated the um, iconography and the ways of thinking of the world in the late 19th century. It, it dominated um, all politics, law, according to Jan Melissa Fran. It influenced the way people saw the world. Catholicism, according to um, Dominic James, is, that's another interesting point, is that he says that such, the, the, the iconography, the ways of feeling material things that came via Catholicism through, I mean, everyone read Newman, for instance. Everyone's reading Newman. And um, came um, to people, um, the, the way it came was a challenge to capitalism, to materialism, as it, it was emerging you know, at the same time. So these people, this is the thing that your question reminded me of. You want to ask me, um, you're asking me about her influences. I'm looking really here at the shaping of her own intellectual life and the influences that she had. For instance, she's obviously read Clifford, and, but she does, she's rejected him. She's got off, if you like. She's got off the argument. She's not joining in. None of her arguments against, Clif against Clifford fit with any of the other arguments, contemporary arguments against Clifford, you see? So she's forging her own way. When you say, did she, um, she didn't, may not have necessarily even have written this to anyone, but she may have said it to someone, in a sense. And that's what's so interesting too, because um, I know that John de Gramio, he, he sent around a lovely picture of the chess game. I don't know if you saw that. He sent a lovely picture of the chess game around, and there's um, Arthur and Rose playing chess together. And you look at that and you think, here are two people with two entirely different ways of viewing Christianity. Arthur was more based on reason, like uh, Rose's mother. Rose was based on feeling. So that's the, the difference. When you're, uh, when you're talking about connections with other people, um, not that it, this box is a collection of tiny little bits and pieces. It doesn't have any letters from Rose in it. You're piecing her together uh, from what she has. So if you want to, you know, as a kind of standard um, kind of, uh, position uh, that Rose, that I, could, I did with Anne, her mother. Her mother is quite clear. You can tell her whole intellectual history from the letters. And it's very straightforward. But Rose was a harder, harder thing because I am piecing it together. And um, when we're looking at her correspondence with other people, um, there's probably a lot to be found. But this box is at the Mitchell Library was what I concentrated in. There's none of her correspondence there. Um, we might take a question from, from online, just to give people online a chance to get in. Uh, Nancy, did I see your hand up a, a moment ago? I did, but I thought I should give people in the room uh, a go since they, they're actually there. So uh, thank you so much. That was just fascinating. Someone that I, I knew a little bit about around the periphery, but um, it's just so interesting going into her intellectual life. Um, but, but I guess I want to... Uh, become material again and, and so you talked about her focus on the suffering body uh, and also how she included herself when she was raising issues about women and um, the way that women were treated and, and so on and um, so did she have lived experience that you think helped to bring about this particular focus on suffering um, I'm, I'm thinking um 
this idea of the suffering body was, is, is quite common at the time. There is the suffering body feeds into everything. And Anne Kerthwaite has written about uh, um, Australian um, the beginnings of the idea of uh, trauma, settler trauma, as being based on suffering. So that the suffering is, is as an idea is sort of pervasive too. It's not it's not just hers. Um, I when I'm I'm thinking of a disconnect there when you talk when you when you mention her real experience um, feeding into I do see real experience feeding into her views of working women in her relations with her servants, which are difficult. Um, but I don't really see that she has a precise emphasis on a suffering in her own life only in the extent that all, all us women suffer and all women are, um, are suffering equally in being struck dumb being not our voices are not heard um, more it's more connected to that no I, um, I don't think there is much in her personal life that I would say uh, related to suffering, though of course you know there is um, the the family, her family definitely were involved in colonising right up through the Namoi. Arthur himself um, you know, was involved at some point. All of this involved um, violence. So how the position she's come to is a reaction to that violence. That's an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. And um, with Anne, for instance. The way she deals with it is with humour, the way she deals with the history of violence, the way she deals with the idea of violence is humour. But um, with Rose, I'm thinking maybe it, it might be, it, it may relate to this kind of um, rejection of reason, maybe part of that. I'm not sure the oh, yeah. Yeah, just um, and I'd just like to mention that I'm so happy to see you here, Cliff, uh, one of my postgrad students who's who's grappling with questions just like this. Thank you. Jude. Hello. Um, thanks, Paula. I'm Jude Conway. So really, yes, yes. really interesting to hear your discussion of um, Rose. Um, I, uh, you know, Rose's circle, like her brothers, of course, were intellectuals, the Rustons um, and in Victoria too, and I'm wondering, it might be worth, it would be great if someone one day, maybe you could go down and look at, because there's Rusden papers down in Victoria, mm. maybe there's a letter from from Rose in there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there'd, there'd yeah. Be, I think there'd be a lot to George, George and, William, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and um, also I'm thinking, you know, based on Nancy's question, remember that quote about when Rose visited um, Maitland prison one time with her father when she was young and she saw the prisoners in chains and that really affected her mm -hmm. you know she 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 always remembered that mm -hmm. and another bit of suffering I think that she saw close hand was her sister older sister Serena um you know who, who had many oh, I can't remember exactly how many children in, in a very short period of time and then and then the the Company, her, you know, the property went bankrupt and her Serena had a nervous breakdown. Mm. So, I mean, she did, you know, as anybody in, in daily life um, did experience, um, you know, was saw close hand lots of different forms of suffering, didn't she? Serena is interesting in herself because Serena um, is, has her own particular perspective. And um, on, on religious ideas that are different to Rose, for instance. And she was, um, she, um, Judith Allen has, has her, up, up, not upstairs, she lives in the drawing room because she can't get up the stairs. She, uh, Rose Scott, and she doesn't like the meetings. She, she um, uh, tries, to, tries to sort of interrupt them as much as possible. So, but Serena has, has her own perspective, which is, um, on religion, and it's um, a, of a different form to Rose's, um, indeed, and more perhaps in line with her mother. But she's also um, terribly anti-science. Um, Serena's Serena had um, she she had the um, 
the bankruptcy wasn't so much the problem with Sarana. The, the problem with her was that she, when the bankruptcy happened, they'd sent Walker to England. Walker Scott, um, the, her son, he was seven years old. He was sent to England to stay with Amelia Gilman, who wrote the poems, and um, he died. And she never forgave herself for letting him go. And um, that shapes a lot of her. But still, um, Serrano has, I mean, he's living in the, the cottage. There's two houses. There's Glendon, the big house, and they've moved to the cottage. And but she's still running Glendon because it's owned by one of the spots. She's still running the station while um, her husband, Helenus, is away working on the gold fields as commissioner in the 50s. So she's um, there by herself. She's running the whole estate. And this is, you know, nobody comments this is unusual or anything. Mm -hmm. She's managing all of the workers. She's um, fighting with the servants. And she still um, has enough time. There's, there's a wonderful quote of hers that I really like. She's um, sewing a dress. She's sewing a dress that was made for her of muslin. Um, She's re-sewing it. She's remaking it for her daughter. And it was made originally for Serana by Rose and her sister. They had sewed it together and given it to Serana. She's re cutting it up and remaking it. And she says, while I'm doing it, I think of the two who made it for me and of the reshaping that I'm going to do. It's very much like the thinking they have. So it's Piecing broad together, picture, isn't thinking it? apart, yeah, yeah, very much like always broad picture yeah. thinking. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 fascinating. Yeah. Okay, uh, we had, a, I think we had a comment online that I'll just quickly pull up so that we don't lose it. Um, so uh, Rose McKinney said, uh, "Thank you for this. Apologies, about to go now. As a classical scholar, this is all new to, this is all nearly new to all new to me. But I love the classical allusions. It was really interesting how you draw on her personal material to uncover the uh, the, the the intellectual uh, threads. Uh, are there other questions from online? I just don't want to neglect our online audience. No, we're doing okay. Okay, other comments in the." Uh, things to say but I'll say them later it's going to take too long <laughs> okay well we've come to, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I've got some interest in Eliza Dunlop was she, is her name ever mentioned in because she was out at Wollombi and I just wondered if they if there was ever any correspondence or... no but I t I'll tell you what um the um the Bengals are interesting as well the, um the Bengal sisters and um, Serana is out at um, Glendon, they're singleton. She seems to have quite a lot to do. They have, seem to have a different kind of wider circle than, um, than Rose. So she might appear in some of the Bingle papers. But um, we... Um, are the Bingle papers in the Mitchell Library? Um, the, uh, definitely they are. They are in the Mitchell Library. I haven't looked at them, but we do have an art historian, Molly Duggins, who is working on women's scrapbooks. Mm -hmm. And she um, was uh, one of the fellows last year, and she just gave a paper that was, you know, advertised here. But she is looking from an art perspective on um, the scrapbooks, and she's told me about a lot of the links that the Bengals have, you know, the, um, that is similar. I know that they're mentioned in um, Serana. Um, so that's that's what the end. All righty. Well, we've come up to the end of the hour. So please join me in thanking uh, Paula again for that. Really interesting. Uh, before you go, a quick reminder that our next seminar uh, paper will be on Friday, the thirty-first of March. So that's next week instead of the usual two-week period, just to, because of the upcoming break. Our presenter will be Matthew Bailey from, the University, from Macquarie University, and his topic is The Competition That Matters, Histories of Shopping Centres in Australia, with examples from Newcastle. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, uh, everyone, and I hope to see you then.